And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, I'm your host, Robert Picto. Scientists started developing air pollution monitoring devices in the 1940s. Since little known about the chemical nature of smog and had never been before measured, they started from scratch. On today's Open Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 1991. On December 19th, the Ministry of Environment published an air quality advisory for Smithers. It requested that owners of home wood-burning appliances refrain from using them unless it was their only heat source. The temperature at the time was dipping to about minus 30. The decision to issue that advisory was based in part on visibility data. We do have the transmissometer results which shows around midnight on the 19th a drop in visibility to below 10 kilometers until the early morning of the 19th which was yesterday and then a slight increase in visibility as the uh, afternoon breeze tended to disperse some of the smoke and then another drop in visibility as the evenings as the smoke built up and the uh, inversion intensified during the evening. Along with that visibility data, the weather forecast and venting conditions for smoke added up to the decision to issue Smithers' first ever request for a voluntary burning curtailment. The advantage of the recently installed transmissometer over the air samplers that have been in place in Smithers is the results are immediately available. All we can hope to do now is measure the, the air quality on a real-time basis, that is, try to get the measurements for the last hour on a real-time basis, and advise residents of Smithers that the air quality is poor based on our measurements and have them act accordingly. That's all we can do for now. This is the first time, and it may be that it, it'll take a number of times before people uh, even hear about an air, air quality advisory. Um, so it, you know, it may be over a winter that people become more aware of what's going on and, and are willing to or even know about you know, this program to voluntarily turn off their wood stoves. When the transmissometer was installed, it was hoped that over time a correlation would show up between periods of low visibility and bouts of high amounts of suspended particulate in the air. It happens that first concrete evidence may be on its way, since the air samplers were all running during the period of December 19th and 20th. However, even without that confirmation, Brian Wilkes is convinced this is a wood smoke problem. But this is clearly a wood smoke phenomenon. This kind of uh, staining and loading on the filter is clearly a wood smoke phenomenon. But while these look quite dramatic in um, sort of our normal conditions, it would still be brown on white. Yes, yes, it's still brown on white. And, and it's possible, despite how poor the air quality was yesterday, it's possible that these still do not exceed the 150 micrograms per cubic meter. It's possible that these are still below the residential limit for suspended particulate. And the reason for that is that the particles are so small. There are lots of them, but their mass don't add up to 150 microns per, micrograms per cubic meter. See? And, and that figure is what? That's the residential standard for s suspended particulate. Wood smoke and from wood stoves, not beehive burners. But the smoke from the burners was episodic, first of all. It wasn't continuous, but also that it was because it because it's so hot it lofted to the height of the inversion layer about 500 feet it was well above town it was way over the town and it was clearly demonstrated yesterday by anybody looking sideways at it that there was two layers there was the layer up there with the burner smoke and then there was the layer close to the ground which this is sampling which is from the wood stoves this is cold smoke coming out of these chimneys it's colder smoke than a thousand degree behind burner. So they're, they're 
These filters contain samples of particulate suspended in Smithers air on the 19th of December. And while they're obviously dirty, they also smell strongly of wood smoke. The Environment Ministry intends to continue its monitoring of the air quality over Smithers, building its database, comparing visibility with the results of samples like these. And residents can expect further air quality advisories asking them to turn off their wood stoves. Last winter's yeah. survey shows that 1% uh, of homeowners in the town do not have an alternative heat source. So 1% do not have an alternative heat source. So the rest of us, 99%, can heat the house by some other means. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. Before 911 was introduced, there was no centralized number that people could call in times of emergency. Anyone who wanted to contact the police or fire department had to dial zero to reach a telephone operator or dial a 10-digit number. Let us return to the archives with Diane Penner. For example, I, was, I am under this understanding that the coroner had um, completed an inquest last year with regard to the death of the boy that drowned in the pond up on the bench. And his recommendation to council was that a 911 system might have um, made that situation a little bit better. As a result, that boy drowned. And uh, I'm, I think probably if a person thinks about it, there's a lot of situations an older person who, um, who can't get to the phone and, and dial a number could probably do a 911. Children can do it. Anybody who's panicking can do it. 911 is something that's been forced into our brains by media and by um, television programming. It's so simple. It, why don't we have it? It just doesn't make any sense to me. You, know, you mentioned the cost factor, and that's something mm -hmm. we should touch upon a little bit more. Obviously, people watching will be wondering just how much the cost factor will be. Any idea? All the research that I've done so far hasn't come up with any dollar figure. But I know that legitimately speaking, there are simpler ways of doing it where, there, where we don't have to have a high cost factor. So I would be willing to settle with simple at this point for just to get the, the program underway. And um, from there on, I think that everybody who has or who can see that an accident can occur, and I think we all can, would be willing to pay a couple extra dollars on their BC Tel bill to implement the system. The regional district, of course, involves a lot more people than just the city of Terrace, and as a result, uh, perhaps that would be an angle that uh, people could look at to install this system. Do you not feel that way? Regional district was, um, was asked to come up with a cost figure. Uh, apparently, from what I understand, this was done 10 years ago, and since then it's been left on the back burner. Obviously, from, from 10 years ago to now, a lot of computer changes have happened within BCTEL because they're an upgraded system now. So the cost factor that they had back then, which was slated to be way too high, will be much lower at this point. Have you personally broached uh, the regional district yourself or city council at this time? Uh, all the people that I've spoken to in the last few weeks are on holidays. <laughs> so um, I'll, be, I'll be contacting them. And I've offered uh, my services to um, the municipal office, but they are not aware of that yet. They'll find out at their, at their meeting. I've sent them a letter. And I've um, offered to set up a cost factor and a, and a procedure report for them. If they don't have the manpower to do it, I'm quite willing to do it. And it, d it certainly doesn't take a genius to put this together. All it takes is somebody who's concerned. And I think um, that there's an awful lot of us out there who are concerned about this, and I am one. It's a major undertaking for a, a one individual, I would imagine. Uh if viewers are interested in helping you out, you'd certainly welcome their uh, participation. Yeah. yeah, that would be great. What kind of procedure is the next step as far as you're concerned? Um, when I spoke to the fire chief in town, he said that they were monitoring 911. They wanted to see how many people were dialing 911 to see whether or not it was even worth doing. So I think if a lot of people started dialing 911, <laughs> that we could probably create some sort of, uh, of um, uh, emphasis on what's happening. I don't really know what else to say at this point. Um, basically, council needs to know that we want it. So it's council's decision whether or not we're going to get it. It's up to City Hall. They're the ones who give the go-ahead. So if enough people can say that they're interested in it, phone, phone your mayor or your alderman and let them know. I suppose as far as you're concerned, the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And if 911 is all it takes to prevent a catastrophe or disaster mm -hmm. of some kind, then why not is it in? Why isn't it in? 
basically I don't want my child or my mother or my father or my friends sitting on the floor and, and having um, the opportunity to do something simple that might save their life and not have it there just because of a few dollars is what it comes down to be. I, it is an ounce of prevention. And right now it's also a squeaky wheel gets oiled first, so I'm going to start squeaking, I think. <laughs> Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Beavers are Canada's national animal, however, they have a mixed reputation. This past June, a single beaver caused widespread internet outage here in the Northwest when the little critter gnawed its way through an aspen tree, which severed fiber optic lines when it fell. Let us return to the archives with Gene. The destruction of our country's national symbol had Prince Rupert residents quite upset. Two months ago, two beavers were trapped and destroyed while they were living in Moresby Pond, which is within city limits, by two private trappers who were hired by the city. Now, the municipality says they received several complaints from nearby residents who said that beavers were chewing trees on private property and chewing trees that could be weakened and in a windstorm be blown over onto a nearby power pole. Mayor Peter Lester then put a ban on all trapping of beavers down at Moresby Pond after he learned that a private resident had agreed to wrap the remaining trees with chicken wire and tar paper in hopes of discouraging the beavers from dining in the area. So it would appear that the problem has been solved. Or has it really? City engineer Mike Stamhughes is hoping that the situation will resolve itself hopefully before springtime. It is possible that uh, with the three beavers that are left, we may not have a problem anymore. We're going to just wait and see. Uh, I think as far as the city is concerned, it's desirable to have the wildlife there. It enhances the mm -hmm. park. Um, and we only went moved in uh, when we found that uh, the beavers were actually uh, endangering or a nuisance to the public. So you still feel that the city made the right decision in trapping the beavers and destroying them? I believe so. Um, I, uh, I'm not aware of any solutions that have been uh, presented um, that are that we're certain could be uh, could have been enacted or uh, implemented that are reasonable. I don't believe we could have live trapped them or relocated the beavers. I don't know that it's reasonable to wrap all the trees in the area. I don't know whether we could have. Um, we would have to get permission to go into private property, and it's private property is one of the prime areas where we're concerned. Mm -hmm. um, so whether that's a sol solution, I don't know. Um, but uh, we're certainly open to suggestions. Um, it may be it may be reasonable now to to look at that opportunity. There aren't that many trees left that they mm -hmm. that are that uh, tasty to beavers anymore. Uh, so. Uh, there may it may be possible to wrap the trees uh, now while we have lots of time while they're not that active. Alderman Foster Husoy feels the continually rising beaver population is a bigger problem the city must contend with. Well, the major problem, like when there was one beaver there alone, or even if there's only two beavers there, the problem is not a big deal. But now that the beaver that was there has found a mate and mated and produced three offspring those offspring are going to need homes. And, and uh, there's no way that five beavers can live in that one pond. So what's going to happen is that the beavers, the young beavers, will either mate with each other or go and find a mate, and they'll move up the stream and dam that portion of the stream, possibly flood out the campground, maybe go on up the stream towards the foot of the mountain and dam it up and flood out the homes down below my place here, uh, above Park Avenue. And it'll just continue. As long, as long as that colony is allowed to grow, it'll be, be a problem in the city. Now, if, if, uh, if we followed Bob Barker's suggestion and have, had all our pets neutered and spayed and just left them there, it wouldn't be any problem. And, then we, and it would be a, a, a tourist attraction. But if they're going to be left to increase and multiply, it's going to be a major problem to the people of Prince Rupert. Fern Whittles, manager of the SBCA, admits the furry rodents did do some damage to trees, but feels there were other alternatives to the problem. There had been quite a bit of damage done by uh, beavers, which they claimed there was five in there. Two were killed off the night before. Um, 
They had climbed up the embankment towards houses, uh, which were about 40 feet away from the, mm -hmm. there, and were gnawing on trees, cutting through halfway through. These trees were a danger to falling on. One big tree especially was a danger to falling on a house, which the city had chopped down and eliminated that problem. The rest of the trees were quite a ways away from the houses. It didn't seem to really be a threat. There's a path going through there, which people walking by, if these trees would have blown over, could have been a threat to them. Uh, I felt the city was chopping them down would have been enough without killing off these beavers. They could have had alternatives of trapping them, live trapping them, uh, to relocate them someplace. Or, as I've found out since, they could have built a fence along there which would eliminate the beavers from going up there. They claimed that the beavers would not go around the fence, they'd go to a different area then of mm -hmm. the park for food. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Workplace safety drills help your employees be prepared in case of emergency. A safety drill helps you practice your evacuation route for fires and other serious emergencies. In this final segment of Open Connection, we return to the archives to see a safety drill with the Buildings Department of CN. Pull it in tight, Wayne. Not in tight with the first one yet. Okay. It's a strange way to spend a day hanging on a rope under a trestle. But there is a reason for these tangled bodies. This crew from the Buildings and Bridges Department at CN is training for a day they hope never comes. Training in rescue techniques just in case they or one of their co-workers gets into trouble. Tuck it inside your cradle, it won't matter. We're just uh, trying to show the CN people uh, basically how to take care of themselves if they do get into trouble. Instead of waiting for a backup system, people, the fire department, the paramedics to come in, they can actually start doing something on their own and uh, get their own people down. And plus, with the training, they also have a chance to see how important it is to be safe on from the day one of their job. So uh, just basically to help them work safer. Well, everybody that has the cradles on can go out now, and then uh, the people that are left without cradles can just be on belay. OK? So make sure you have your gloves. A few times a year, representatives from West Point Safety of Calgary come out and spend a day demonstrating and teaching proper rescue techniques. This trestle is only about 20 meters high, but the procedure is the same no matter what the distance. Well, at first, when I first saw it, I didn't have too much confidence yeah, in there, but the once I tried it, there's nothing to it. Yeah, I'm not scared of heights or whatever, but I guess there's one time, it only takes one time to fall off, and then you do get scared, but... I haven't had that opportunity, and I hope it never happens. You learn well. Man on belay north! For those that have been through this before, it's more of a refresher course than anything else. But for those who are fairly new to the job, it's an experience that takes some getting used to. Now remember to keep your down rope up, but don't twist it too much. So, no, there, let everything go natural on it. So this hooks in this way. Do your neural up on your caravan. The other way. Stick your thumb through the carabiner. And call man on belay. Both go together, Man on belay, help. I've had people that uh, uh, would not go off at first. And what they'll do is sit back and let their co-workers go for a while. And uh, then they'll take, I, I suppose, start trusting the equipment. And they'll do it themselves, too. Oh, man on belay. North. Man on belay, North. Wait for me. All the crews, they have their own uh, rescue equipment with them when they're out at the bridge. If something happens, one guy gets hurt, the rest of the crew just right now gets that equipment set up and they bring him up or bring him down to rescue him and take him uh, to ambulance or whatever. And being a trusting person and someone who's always willing to try something new, I decided to put my life on the line or at least find out firsthand just how safe this procedure is. Lean back until the rope tightens up. 
And then, that's right. Try and keep your knees as stiff as possible. Of course, you have to watch out for the beams behind you. Right. Now, we're dealing with about uh, 50 feet or so here. That's about that. And procedure no different for how much distance you have to go? Uh, with this one here, with the horned eight, you have to, you can't go over 250 feet. It does put a little twist in the rope, and you might find it does cause a problem. But up to 250 feet, you, it's the same procedure all the time. And if, uh, say, I didn't have control here, the man on the ground, like you say, had pretty good con control? If he thought you were coming out of control, he would automatically pull the rope tight. Uh, otherwise, he shouldn't take control unless you ask for it, which you just ask him to take, you just say control belay. And then he would pull it tight, and then he would have control of you. Okay. And you, there are no problems ever with this, right? Never. Okay. Never had a problem before. And then you can control speed pretty easy. Sure, one hand or the other. Ready to catch? Sliding down on a secure line is actually pretty easy stuff. It gets a little tougher when you have to stop halfway and help somebody who's in trouble. Hey, the release play there. Fine, eh? Yeah, release play there. Just unhook one half of the sling and then I'll pull it back up. Some techniques uh, will we'll figure something a little different, which, but it, it's pretty well basic all the time. Uh, we, we develop uh, uh, a winching system to, to lift them off. From, if they fell into a place where they had to be lifted up, we have a Z-Hall system we can show them. We have a goose neck that we've uh, designed for a bridge without a handrail like this one. Uh, with a handrail, it's not too bad, but without the handrails, that makes it more difficult. So we do uh, try and develop techniques. If uh, the customer comes to us and says they need something uh, different, then we'll try and develop it for them. We always try, like this course here for CN was custom designed for CN, for the railway. I'll show you how to lock off. Just refresh memories. Carol, Carol? While it looks safe, there's always a chance something can go wrong. And like any good instructor, Dean gave a brief demonstration. From the bottom, tight to your hand, that's a perfect mark, okay? Reach around, grab a hold, and hook it over. <laughs> Stop. Oh. Who knew that happens well with a the camera? They better edit that one out, I'm telling you. I think we'll put that on the news. That's the one we saved. That's a blackmail one. Yeah, send that to Pete. Yeah, right. Let's get this set up again. Good thing I was only four feet off the ground. But that did happen up high, of course, this layman could pull over No. Okay, I got it. Oh. Let's try this again. Oh, that's not me. You didn't help at all, Mike, there. Nothing. Yeah, <laughs> Slide your back. Hold your foot up. <laughs> yeah, he did that well. Slide your back hand Dean's unplanned body. encounter with the ground was likely a result of his rushing for our camera. But it does illustrate the potential danger, and thus the need for more training and more practice. So up they go again, but this time to practice lowering an injured worker on a stretcher. Down a little bit. Pull him out of the orange rope when you can. Oh, I love the job. It's great. We meet uh, so many different people each year. Uh, it's just, uh, it's the same job, but different people. It's always different every day, so it's very enjoyable. Not only is his job enjoyable, but also very crucial. So the CN crew continues to practice, securing the knowledge that it's better to be prepared for a situation you never encounter. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection, the greatest distance in the existence of man. It's not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictow.